This week on the WriterCon podcast. Do it because you love it. Don't do it for the money. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker Books on Writing, and Laura Bernhardt, award-winning author of the Wantland Files book series. Thank you, Jesse Ulrich, and welcome to all the writers out there. Thanks for joining us. You know, by coincidence, I was just reading about Jesse's favorite writer, James Patterson. This <laughs> prolific author has written... Uh, around 200 books, and his latest is Holmes, Marple, and Poe, co-written with Brian Sitz. Uh, you know, he's collaborated with Dolly Parton, he's collaborated with Bill Clinton, and now he's doing that. And apparently next, he's entering the world of legal thrillers, which, you know, you can imagine my delight. He's got a planned trilogy co-written with Mike Lupica, called 12 Months to Live, featuring a hard-nosed criminal defense attorney with, guess what? 11 Months to Live. (laughs) (laughs) Twist, that's the twist. Off the note, that would be the, no, it's 12. And guess what the sequel already already in the works is called? 11 Months to Live? Well, that would be logical, but no, it's eight months to live and then four months to live. Uh And then I guess it's all over. Wow, he's really, really squeezing that lemon? I don't know what the expression is. Um, (laughs) Unless it's a hit and there's a movie deal, then there'll be three months and 29 days to live. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that's It'll really a whole calendar yeah. to count down. <laughs> well, at, le- at least we all know how the story's going to end, right? One Christmas left to live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Jesse, now that Patterson is writing legal thrillers, should I just retire? Well, no, because you're actually writing thrillers. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> oh! Boom. <laughs> Coming for you, James. Um, Laura, how would you feel yeah. if James Patterson started writing ghost stories? I don't think he's going to write women's fiction, but he might get into mm-hmm. ghost stories. He can do whatever he wants. He's got his own. I, 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 I'm over here. I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to keep doing what I want to do. I have my audience. I don't think they're going to stop reading my books. They can read his too if they want. They won't be as, you know. Very Jesse generous. Won't. Jesse won't, no, but yeah, I know I know my audience is is um, committed. So no. I love my I love my readers. Voice of confidence. All right, our guest today is Thomas Hauser, who's the author of a new lovely memoir about his mama, my mother, and me. He's also the author of many previous books, including sports related books, a bunch about boxing, including a biography of Muhammad Ali and a book on social tolerance that he co-wrote with Muhammad Ali. He also wrote the book Missing, which became the film with Jack Lemmon and Sissy Spacek, and another film, I've seen both of these films, another one called (laughs) Final Warning, The Legacy of Chernobyl. We will talk to Thomas about all that and much more, but first, the news. On our last podcast, we talked about the author who is now suing Amazon over their sale of counterfeit books using his name, which is not a new phenomenon. This time, our news story is about another kind of very dubious book also being sold at Amazon. That's Biographies of Dead Celebrities, written by overnight or virtually instantaneously by AI, artificial intelligence, and that has become a boom market. Some of you may have noticed recently when Tom Smothers, some of us will remember from the Smother Brothers com- Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour television show. Anyway, he passed on December 26th, and that same day, a new book appeared with the clunky and ungrammatical title wait for this tom smothers revealing 
four, that's the number four, numeral four, revealing four untold truth about half of Smothers Brother. Smothers Brother, singular? Yeah, and they Come think on. that AI is going to replace writers, huh? Mm. <laughs> Toby Keith recently passed, great Oklahoma-based country music star. Biography showed up right after his death. One, get this, one of them had this disclaimer on it. Quote, the author and publisher make no warranties about the accuracy or completeness of the content. <laughs> this is a supposed biography. It, it also said, resemblance to real persons is coincidental, <laughs> which hey. is not what you normally expect to see. On a At least they're telling you. Biography. Time, so. <laughs> yeah. But push came to shove when this happened to a man named Joseph Lulleveld, and I apologize if I mispronounced that name. He's a former executive editor at the New York Times. He passed last month, and his brother Michael went online to see, you know, how he's being remembered. What he found was obituaries. Well, he expected that, but he also found at least half a dozen biographies published on Amazon in the days immediately following his brother's death, some of them available for purchase on the very day he died. The books, according to Michael, described his brother as a chain smoker, someone who honed his skills in Cairo, and someone who reported from Vietnam, none of which is true. (laughs) According to a program called GP, PT0, which is is designed to detect AI-generated text, there is a 97% chance that the book was created by AI. I'm thinking maybe the odds are actually higher than 97%. (laughs) Uh, This is just a macabre new publishing subgenre, these uh, quickly slapped together shoddy AI-generated books about people who just passed away. Laura, are you outraged? I am horrified. This is so skeezy. And honestly, this is not a good look for AI. AI has... Or Amazon, yeah. Good use. Yeah, there are, there are great times to use um, AI, chat GPT. But, but yes, why is Amazon continuing to allow this garbage to clog up their system? I hate it. But also... I'm going to say it, buyer beware. Right. Mm-hmm. If, if you've got a disclaimer or a title like that, don't buy that mess. If we stop buying it, it'll dry up and go away. People are only doing it because they're making money on it. It's like every other scam. You've got you've to protect yourself and don't fall for it. Well, yeah. And why is it dead celebrities are the leader? You know, it's not just on Amazon. I know the Facebook group site for WriterCon for a long time was being plagued with all these uh, fake posts about yes. celebrities get attention. Being dead yeah. who aren't dead, but click it's a big here. Name and someone's going to recognize. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it, it grabs attention because people recognize it. And if they've passed away, it's. Looks so like it's an now, easy thing to grab. Yeah, I'll pair one of those uh, posts about not dead celebrities with a link to an AI written biography of the not dead celebrity. And <laughs> I don't know, Jesse, are you're stroking your beard? Does that mean you're disgusted, or yeah, you're I thinking just, about how you can get in on this? I mean, well, listen, part of my mind's always like, how can I make money off this? But like, I don't actually do any of those things. I mean, th- <laughs> this is definitely one of those times. Like, yes. Like Amazon should easily be able to write some sort of algorithm that says biography of person, like date of death, earliest time a biography could possibly come out, like six months at least, right? It, it does not seem like it would be that hard to no, stump but on this. Th- in this particular case, I'm more mad at the people buying these books. Like, what are they thinking? <laughs> sure. Here's a book that came out. Well, they read the obituary and they think, oh, I always love Tom Smothers. I'd like to know more about him. And Boom! There's the biography, and uh, like the, the like, I guess like Amazon doesn't re- half of Smother Brother. Yeah, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like uh, like I'm very curious about what the fake Toby Keith uh, biography title was, and if it included mm. red solo cups or not, or if they got the color of the cup wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just this is one of those things where like you understand the emotional connections of how people get to the thing, mm-hmm. and again, Amazon is just like still like the Wild West of 
regulating what's mm-hmm. being sold on their platform. And it's, well, we, we reported this on this yeah. earlier, but now when you upload a new book to Amazon, if you're self-publishing or or if you're a publishing house, it asks you, was AI used in the generation of this content? You check yes or no, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. The book's no. going up no matter what. If, <laughs> if you click, if you click yes, a human being should be forced to look at it. You'd Amazon think. Yeah. again. Bill and I will split the one percent of your profits to do that for you. <laughs> yes, but, but we're here, the, Amazon. We we're can here. help. Who's, we're here. Who's checking for accuracy of that? Because yeah. the person who's producing that terrible biography is not going to be honest and say, "Yep, I just told right? Chat GPT yeah. to knock out a quick biography for me." That 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 Chat GPT zero thing should be built into Amazon's publishing platform. Mm. All right, news story number two, which is much better news for authors, but I really just picked this story for you, Jesse. My boy. It involves Brandon (laughs) Sanderson, who has single-handedly gotten better, more author-friendly royalty rates for everybody at Audible, which, of course, is the audiobook distributor, which is also owned by the aforementioned Amazon. Uh, He's been concerned about the low royalty rates they offered and the lack of transparency, meaning we can't tell how you got to that number from your royalty state, basically. And he thought authors should do better. So when it came time to sell his very popular books as audiobooks, he was in the catbird seat. Some people will remember last year we covered this story where he kickstarted some books into production for a huge sum of money. And now he's got his own uh, printing press and, and distribution center. I mean, he's into book publishing in a big, big way. So yeah. they would listen to him. Anyway, his efforts negotiating with Audible have paid off not just for him, but for everyone. They have now increased minimum royalty rates so authors get more. He's improved the transparency so authors get more detailed information. And authors will receive their royalties more frequently, monthly. In other words, exactly what Author Equity recently announced they were going to do at their publishing house. I mean, uh, the the response has been enthusiastic as well it should be because here is an author who is at the top of his game and using that clout to to help everyone. Jesse, so your writer hero strikes again. Is this a big a deal as it seems like to me? Well, I think so because most authors of his uh, stature will happily take a better deal for themselves, but he specifically held out and like – was not able to offer his his fans something that they wanted because he's like, we, like I, I want to do better for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, are you listening, James? Um, <laughs> like I mean, and You're he calling and, out the only author who might have as much or more right? clout yeah, than like, Brandon Sanderson, St- Stephen King, uh, James Patterson, um, like all of those old tier writers could also do this and they don't mm-hmm. feel like they need to because they're already making enough and he even said in his response to getting these things he's like i didn't get everything i wanted there's still work to do but he's like at least now you know independent independent authors will get more than they were getting before and i, I just right. i it's, it's just a really respectful thing to do i'm just i'm 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 proud of a person I've never met whose books I love. So. <laughs> I agree. It was, it was uh, just great work. Laura, you think this will spread? You think this is going to increase royalties at other places, other audiobook distributors? Well, it took one person of his stature to really stand up and and make this happen. It's very impressive. But how many years have groups of... Um, maybe less, less powerful people banded together in an attempt Mm -hmm. to make the same thing happen. And it doesn't. So it it really does take someone to um, really get their attention and, and push change through, which is impressive. So I, but again, I feel like it has to, so I don't, I don't think anyone's going to say, "Hmm, maybe we should do that. Maybe that is better Mm. for authors. Maybe we should do it too. I think people only make, I think corporations only make these changes when they are forced to, when it really is a bad look, if they don't, somebody points it out. Just like when we were talking um, previously about the case that Goggins brought, Mm -hmm. Um, so many people are getting ripped off like that, but 
only when he was calling them out and making Amazon look really bad did they go in and police uh, the pirated books that were yeah. mm-hmm. taking money away from him. So I, I feel like corporations, yeah. if they have no reason to, they don't make these changes. Yeah. Well, it seems to me the only, I, I mean, for instance, Find Away Voices, which we've talked about on this program before, uh, their primary selling point was, we give you better rates than Audible does. Uh, of course, Find Away Voices have now been purchased by Spotify because they're trying to break into the audiobook market. Jesse, did you, you have a thought there? Well, I don't know if you've been following this uh, this this other story where, where like authors are noting there's been a like change in the terms with mm-hmm. Find Away Voices and Spotify yeah. where like you're giving them some control over your own IP like Spotify can then right. use some of those things and then write other stories and people are like don't sign this and I, and I agree again like can you not just be a marketplace why are you trying to like also create things and also sell things like just be the thing that yeah. you are to be fair I think Find Away Voices backed off that pretty quick but yeah. only after people started complaining about yeah. it yeah but- like but again, it was it was the attempt, and they only pulled mm-hmm. back because people noticed. Like they right, right. they they chose to do it anyway. So yeah, you're right. All right. Well, that's the news in the writing world, good and bad. Jesse, cue up the music. Let's talk to Thomas Hauser. Thomas, welcome to the podcast. Hey. Good to be with you all. Good to see you, too. Okay, first traditional question. If you could offer writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Do it because you love it. Don't do it for the money because you're probably not going to make much money and you'll probably love it. (laughs) That's not the message, Thomas. No. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's actually really good advice. <laughs> uh, uh, Lara, I'm sure you've had countless authors say to you, "Why haven't my books sold more copies? Why haven't I made more money?" Mm-hmm. As a rule, it doesn't work that way. Every now and then, you get lucky. But you uh, get lucky, exactly. Works, so many it. people come to me and say, "And then it'll get made into a movie or a TV show or this or that." And I think we can always hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I started off with uh, with. Uh, a very lucky success. The first book I wrote was Missing, which was made into a feature film. And I said mm-hmm. to myself, well, this is easy. You write a good book. It gets reviews. They make a feature film out of it. It's <laughs> translated into 20 languages. And yeah. no, that's not the way it works. It doesn't Again, happen every time. <laughs> huh? Yeah. But I still love it. Right. Well, that's uh, it's the same advice Laura and I give, because I know in my experience, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 plus years, you too, and I, I've had hits, I've had complete bombs. <laughs> but if you wrote the book for the right reason, because you cared about something in the first place, then it doesn't matter so much. The book's still on the shelf, right? Well, it's if, if you love writing it and you're happy with the end product, it's not a bomb. Yeah, it's well, part of the creative legacy, and it's there forever. That's right. Very nice. All right. Now we just barely touched. We mentioned missing, but you have a remarkable backlist. You've got nonfiction, sports nonfiction, more general, uh, well, and actual fiction. You've even got a children's book. Can you just not make up your mind what you want to be <laughs> when you grow up? Or I, I just, you know, <laughs> one of the things that that. I've been told by publishers again and again is you shouldn't switch genres. Right. Because the key to financial success, commercial success, is, you know, John le Carre wrote one spy story after another. Stephen King did one horror story after another. The first two books I wrote were dramatic nonfiction stories, Missing and uh, The Trial of a Trollman Tom Mache. Then I decided to write a love story set in a large Wall Street law firm called Ashworth and Palmer. And the editor who liked the first two books didn't want that. And then the editor who loved Ashworth and Palmer didn't want the philosophy on moral values. And then the editor who bought that said, what am I going to do with a book about boxing? <laughs> so it, it, I, what I, I write what I want to write. And it, I've written novels about Charles Dickens and Mark Twain. I've actually just started writing a novel about Sherlock Holmes. And uh, I love it. 
because I can pick anything I want to write about, learn about, and, and do it. Mm-hmm. Now, I have a, a, I have to ask, is this a Sherlock Holmes story, or is it a book about Sherlock Holmes? No, it is a, a Sherlock Holmes novel. I am writing as Dr. John H. Watson, uh, as the original Sherlock Holmes novels and short stories were. And right now I'm still in the research stage, which means I have to read everything that a Conan Doyle wrote about Sherlock Holmes, uh, look at some of the early movies. I'm not looking at the more recent Sherlock Holmes books and movies because mm-hmm. I don't want to be influenced by them. Uh, but I'm having a great time. And uh, mm-hmm. the wonderful thing about fiction is you can take the book anywhere you want. I spent half a day researching Lewis Carroll last week because there's an important dinner party scene in the book. And I thought, well, the dinner party would be more interesting for readers if there was a famous guest there. Who should it be? And I said, well, how about Lewis Carroll? His Uh, life at Sherlock Holmes overlaps. So there mm -hmm. we are. Very fun. I want to talk some more about that first book of yours, Missing. That's described as the chilling, true account of a young American's disappearance. It was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, the Bancroft Prize, and the National Book Award. Oh, that's a pretty impressive debut. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and what inspired you to write it? I was working as a lawyer on Wall Street at the time. Uh, I wanted to try my hand at writing. And uh, this is a true life story of an American named Charles Horman who was one of two Americans killed during the coup in Chile in 1973 that overthrew Chilean President Salvador Allende. And it's now quite clear from everything that's been revealed that the United States government uh, played a huge role in fomenting the coup. Uh, There were three questions surrounding Charles' death. And when I started researching, we didn't have answers. By the time I finished, we had two of the three questions answered. The first is, was Charles killed by the Chilean military? Because they said his body was just found on the streets, and there was convincing evidence that he was. The second question was, did the United States government officials seek to cover up facts surrounding his death? And again, there was convincing evidence they did. The third issue was whether the United States government officials had foreknowledge of or possibly even ordered Charles Horman's execution to keep quiet things that he had learned about the coup. And in 2014, many years later, a Chilean court, after examining all the evidence, found that, yes, our government had played a role. A man named Ray Davis, who was the head of the United States military group in Chile, had passed Charles's name on to the Chilean military, and things happened from there. Uh, at the time, it was a trailblazing book, and more so trailblazing movie. Costa mm-hmm. Gavras was the director. It was the first overtly political American film that had been made. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got involved because I had known Terry Simon, who was the woman in Chile with Charles and his wife when he was killed. I met the parents uh, through Terry. And when I decided to leave Law and Right, this seemed like an important story, dramatic story. And I figured, well, let me try my hand and and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And that was the start of it all. I did all my research and I was putting all my notes on index cards. This is pre-computers. And finally, I'd finished all my research and I had a stack of index cards, you know, this high. And I remember looking at them one evening and saying, boy, you've really done it. You left a good, secure job as a lawyer on Wall Street. How are you going to turn this mess into a book? And I said, well, you know, I've broken this down into 12 chapters. Let me put the index cards into 12 piles. That'll make them a little easier to work with. And it it went from there. Yeah, great. So Missing Becomes a Movie, something most writers dream about. What was that experience like for you? It was fun. It was a little heady. You know, I hear athletes say all the time, boxers who win world championships when they're young, you know, basketball players who win titles when they're young. And later on, they say, I didn't appreciate at the time 
what it meant and mm -hmm. how it was right. involved and, and how lucky I was for this to happen. Uh, I knew it was a lot of fun to go through. I didn't realize how rare the experience was. Uh, I've had one more film made since then. But the satisfaction for me, really, the greatest satisfaction is in the books. I've always said I got too much credit for the movie missing and not enough credit for the book. These, with a book, you can control what you write. Right. And from my point of view, once the book is out there, if I've written it the way I want to, if it's nicely published and, uh, you know, Admission Press has done a beautiful job with publishing my mother and they, you know, they really have. Lara, thank you. Um, at that point, I'm my happy. Pleasure. That's there forever. It's part of my creative legacy and in this case, part of my mother's legacy. And anything that, good that happens after that is gravy. The, the nicest thing about a book selling well isn't even the money as much as the fact that the message is being read by more and more people. You mentioned another movie. That's Final Warning, right? The Chernobyl Correct. story. Legacy of Chernobyl. And you've also written both a biography and co-written a book with uh, Muhammad Ali, right? Right, right. Uh, that was an experience. That was a wonderful experience. No doubt. Uh, Tell us about that. Well, the, the big book, Muhammad Ali, His Life and Times, uh, came when I was approached in October of 1988 by Muhammad and his wife. They wanted what we all hope would become the definitive Muhammad Ali biography. And I don't think I'll ever have a professional project that, that brings me as much joy as that one did. And then later... Uh, we wrote a short book together. Uh, the thoughts were both of ours. I obviously did most of the writing, but it was called Healing. And if you spell out healing, the three middle letters are A-L-I, uh, uh, which was... Uh, and uh, nice. this is a short journal of tolerance and understanding. What we did was we had an essay at the beginning and then we took about 100 quotes from people throughout the ages, from everybody from you know, Thomas Jefferson to Martin Luther King Jr. to St. Augustine to the Quran to you know, just quotes across the board that would hopefully get people to think about tolerance and understanding. And then with the help of HBO, we went to a number of schools across the country, high schools and middle schools, where we talked to students about our theme. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, in fact, I, there, there are all sorts of wonderful memories. One that just popped up into my mind was we were at Richards Middle School in Atlanta, Georgia. And we got out of the car that had taken us there. Actually, it was a bus. There was a media bus with us. And Muhammad and I got off the bus. And we had to walk through a whole long line of cheerleaders. Mm. We were standing there, <laughs> waving pom-poms, singing, chanting, really, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Richard nice. welcomes Muhammad Ali. Uh. <laughs> and the two it. kids at the end would say, and Thomas Hauser. <laughs> 18 people chanting float like a butterfly sting like a bee muhammad and then at the end the two at the end and thomas hauser you know that, that just popped <laughs> in my mind hadn't thought of that for a long time that's lovely a nice memory all right let's talk about your impending release my mother and me a beautiful tribute to your late mother what can you tell us about it well, my mother lived to the age of 96. Uh, she had a long, wonderful, privileged life. Uh, I was very fortunate to have had her for as long as I did. And being a writer, uh, I wanted to write a book about her. Uh, I realized very early on in the process that I couldn't write about my mother without writing about me. And I couldn't write about our relationship without writing about me. So it's autobiographical as well as biographical of her. And uh, it's really a book, not just about two people, but about the bonds between a mother and son, uh, growing old, growing very old. And it's a book I'd like to think that, uh, you know, Mothers would want their sons to read, sons would want their mothers to read, and daughters don't want to throw you know, daughters out of the equation. Uh, 
What I say at one point in the book is that 99.99% of us who ever live are gone and forgotten not long after we die. I mean, for a while, there are people alive who knew us, and then we just become names on a family tree. But most people cease to exist completely in memory. And I wanted my mother to have this marker, and she has it now. And this book takes her through all the stages of her life. There are enough cameo appearances by people like Barbara Streisand and Muhammad Ali and Don King and John Voight and, and some others that I think <laughs> it's fun for you know anybody who yeah, looks There's a great there. story about John Voight. Uh, <laughs> that one made me laugh out loud. That's funny. Yeah. Um, I'll be looking that up tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, uh, it, I, it was wonderful for me. It was, you know, people ask, well, was it cathartic to write? Not really, not really. Uh, I, I, didn't, I thought I would start writing as soon as my mother died, and I didn't. I just wasn't ready to. Uh, mm -hmm. There was just too much else going on in terms of, you know, the details of her death and then setting up her estate and whatever else was going on in my life. So it took a while for me to start writing, and then it took even longer to find the right formula for it. As I said, part of that was understanding that I had to write about myself first uh, before I could write about my mother. But it just, uh, it did bring back a lot of very nice memories. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very thankful that I had the opportunity to write it and now put it out to the world to share who this woman was. Mm, very nice. I can't believe our time has already expired. It seems like we just started. But let me ask, what are you working on now? What can we look forward to in the future? It's a story by Dr. John H. Watson about Sherlock mm -hmm. Holmes. Uh, I had the opening sentence in my mind about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I really started putting it together, I realized the first thing I had to do was change my opening sentence. I've got a, a nice plot. I've got characters that I'm enjoying spending time with in my head. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the point where I finish my researching and outlining and sit down and actually start to write. That's always the best part. With, the, yeah. with a nonfiction book, the interesting part is the research. And by the time you're writing, you say, well, I know this already. <laughs> with a novel, <laughs> the great part is when I start to write, because that's when the characters take on a life of their own and start to do things that I hadn't planned for them. And that's an awful lot of fun. Yeah. Well, well I can't we are wait big to read Sherlock that Holmes one. fans. Yep, I'm yeah. excited to read that one too. I need to have you back on the podcast later. But for now, thank you for joining us, Thomas. I'm glad to be here. And hopefully, we'll have fewer technological problems next time. <laughs> <laughs> All we got part this. of the game. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks. Just a few parting words. I have to remind you about the WriterCon conference, which, of course, is in Oklahoma City every Labor Day weekend. We've got a newly revised website, and the registration page is active, so you can register. And, of course, if you do so now, you get the early bird price. That won't be around much longer, but right now you can save at least $100. Come out to WriterCon. More than 50 speakers from all aspects of the writing world lined up already. Laura, what's mm -hmm. your favorite part of WriterCon? Mm -hmm. I really enjoy getting to meet people. I like getting to meet the people that uh, have been coming for years and years. And this is yes. the only time that I really see them face to face during the year. But I also really enjoy meeting our newbies. And I will do what I did last year, where mm -hmm. I will have um, the night before a time set up where we meet in the lobby so that anyone who is coming in fresh and new does not have to feel overwhelmed or out of place. I'll come meet with you. I'll introduce you. I'll show you around. We have some people who are still connected and made a friends group from that initial meeting mm -hmm. uh, the night before last year. So I will absolutely be doing that again. So nobody's a stranger at WriterCon. No. We, well, we are a great big family. Yeah, that's one of the pluses of the small group retreats, which is in July in oh, Branson this yes. year. But 
uh, those people stick together. Uh, mm-hmm. You not only get a great retreat, you get get beta readers for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, all right, there's enough of that. Thanks for joining us for this podcast. And until next time, you keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. Okay, see you next time. <laughs>